Good morning. Welcome, and thanks to all of you for joining this MCN Public Policy Webinar on how a bill becomes a law. The first thing I'd like to say is at the bottom of, this is Susie Brown, at the bottom of your screen you can see um, the Twitter handle. I don't tweet. Hashtag. <laughs> so Renal tells me all I need to do is say hashtag just to bill MN is what you should use. Anything you want to add about whether people want to tweet today? Join yeah. us in the Twitter conversation. Great. So we have a series of trainings and webinars this year. We hope you join us for several of them. We'd like to share with you that at the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits, our public policy work is designed to support individual nonprofits and Minnesota's nonprofit sector to be their own voice in the public policy process. And we provide training on advocacy and lobbying. We serve as a resource to policymakers on the nonprofit sector and advocate on issues that impact all nonprofits, such as incentives to charitable giving, nonprofit tax exemptions, lobbying rights, and election activity rights. Thank you for joining us in this work. Um, again, my name is Susie Brown. I'm the Public Policy Director at the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits, and I will be presenting this webinar today with my colleague, Renal Ray. So I'm, so I'm, this is Renal. I'm somewhat new in my role at MCN, and while I have a theoretical understanding of how a bill becomes a law, um, I know that the reality can sometimes be pretty different. So my role in today's webinar, and actually our role in today's webinar, myself and the 34 of you on the line and the two of the, you in the room, our role today is to um, ask Susie to share with us how things really work, to ask questions so we're making sure we get out of this what we need to. Um, so I invite you to join me in asking questions and to chat chat with us through the chat function on your screen. Are you in? Let, let us know by answering yes, no, maybe, we'll see. Just correspond. Thanks for your active participation today. So first of all, we'd like to just talk about the learning objectives. I'll share with you, for those of you who saw the PowerPoint in advance, there's really an enormous amount of content um, for this webinar and I won't talk about every word that's in the PowerPoint. Um, I will cover the high points and respond to questions from Renal and others on the webinar. Um, and I'd like to invite all of you to please follow up directly with me or Renal after today's webinar if there are parts of this content that you'd like further information on. But what we'll aim to achieve in today's webinar is the following. We'll review the general steps required for an idea to become a bill and then a law. We'll discuss the variations and nuances of the process, and we'll learn about the ways that nonprofit organizations can be involved in the process. If you have additional learning objectives that you hope for, or specific questions about this process, please type them into your chat box, and we'll do our best to address them throughout the webinar. Okay. The next thing we're going to do is just have a little fun with um, a reminder from our friends at Schoolhouse Rock about how they'll become a law. Whew. You sure got to climb a lot of steps to get to this Capitol building here in Washington. Well, I wonder who that sad little scrap of paper is. I'm just a bill. Yes, I'm only a bill. And I'm sitting here on Capitol Hill. Well, it's a long, long journey to the Capitol City. It's a long, long wait while I'm sitting in committee. But I know I'll be a law someday. At least I hope and pray that I will. But today I am still just a bill. Gee, Bill, you certainly have a lot of patience and courage. Well, I got this far. When I started, I wasn't even a bill. I was just an idea. Some folks back home decided they wanted a law passed, so they called their local congressman, and he said, you're right, there ought to be a law. And he sat down and wrote me out and introduced me to Congress, and I became a bill. And I'll remain a bill until they decide to make me a law. I'm just a bill. Yes, I'm only a bill. And I got as far as Capitol Hill. Well, now I'm stuck in committee, and I'll sit here and wait while a few key Congress men discuss and debate whether they should let me be alone. I hope and pray that 
they will, but today I am still just a bill. Listen to those congressmen arguing. Is all that discussion and debate about you? Yeah, I'm one of the lucky ones. Most bills never even get this far. I hope they decide to report on me favorably, otherwise I may die. Die? Yeah, die in committee. Oh, but it looks like I'm going to live. Now I go to the House of Representatives and they vote on me. If they vote, yes, what happens? Then I go to the Senate and the whole thing starts all over again. Oh, no. Oh, yes. I'm just a bill. Yes, I'm only a bill. And if they vote for me on Capitol Hill, well, then I'm off to the White House where I'll wait in a line with a lot of other bills for the president to sign. And if he signs me, then I'll be alone. He will, but today I am still just a bill. You mean even if the whole Congress says you should be a law, the president can still say no? Yes, that's called a veto. If the president vetoes me, I have to go back to Congress and they vote on me again, and by that time it's over. By that time, it's very unlikely that you become a law. It's not easy to become a law, is it? No. But how I hope and pray that I will, but today I am still just a bill. Okay, thanks everyone for indulging in that couple minutes of overview. We're going to just try to advance the slide here. Um, so that's cute and reminds us of elementary school. Um, but really it goes through the major steps. So what we're going to do today is um, focus our conversation on how that process works in Minnesota and um, some of the nuances along the way and the places that we can get involved as nonprofits. Um, first of all, we'd like to just start at the idea phase, as they did in the little clip. All bills start with an idea. So in your nonprofit organization, uh, I imagine that there are endless ideas that come up every day from your staff or your board or your clients, and some of those things are um, good opportunities for a law change. So one of the examples um, that I'd like to just provide about an idea that came up through our membership at the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits was to change, this was a couple of years ago prior to my work here, was to change the audit threshold for nonprofits. So if any of you are accounting folks, as some of you may have recalled, um, in the past we had an audit threshold, um, as I said, this is before my time, I think it was $500,000 if your revenue was that amount you needed by state law to have an annual financial audit. And for a variety of reasons, um, it was determined that that was too low. And the idea was raised that we could have an audit limit in Minnesota, which was $750,000. And that would be um, an idea that would have to pass as a law. So we brought that forward. So your idea could be from something fairly simple like that to something highly complex. Um, but uh, after you've determined what your good idea is, it's important to think about what is it that you know from your organizational perspective or what information do you have perhaps from the community that you serve that leads you to your good idea. And then thinking through what will the impact be? What will the idea change or do? And what impact will it have in the state of Minnesota? The next thing that we often do in thinking about how to advance our idea into a bill and then a law is think about who else cares about this? So in the case of the audit threshold that I just mentioned, there are a variety of people who cared about it. Maybe first and foremost for us would be our members. They care about it. They thought it was a good idea. And there are some people who maybe we could anticipate would have been opposed or perhaps wary. So a few questions you can ask yourself. Are there other people who might care about your idea? I'd say the answer should always be yes. There probably are very few circumstances in which nobody Nobody else cares about the idea that you're interested in advancing. Have you talked to them, and did they help you develop your idea, and perhaps do they have information that helps make your case? Maybe complementary information or resources, maybe not identical. So then we ask them, are they willing to support our idea publicly? Can we bring them along 
to create a group of people who are willing to work on something together? Are they willing to work with you on advancing your idea? But a really important question related to who else cares about it is, does anyone disagree? And can you anticipate the basis of their opposition? And most importantly, maybe, why do you think they see the situation differently than you do? So in the case of the audit limits, although perhaps not um, actual opposition, maybe people who would have an interest, um, maybe some skepticism, could have been people who do audits, the CPA Society, for example. They would certainly lose business from this, and they may have a different point of view about when organizations should be audited. Perhaps the donor and grant-making community would have some concern about this because they possibly use the audits in doing their own due diligence before um, providing grant funds to nonprofits and others. So a really important part is thinking about who agrees with you and who might disagree with you. Susie, I have a question. So how important is it to um, work with the people or have a good relationship with the folks that are opposed to what you're working on? And vice versa, when is it right to form a coalition of those that are supportive? Right, so this is a relationships business, as you might imagine. It's both technical and very relationship-based. So we have to assess exactly these questions. In some instances, we should approach in a friendly and strategic way, approach the opposition head-on and go right to the people who we think might oppose our work or might be skeptical about it and invite them to share with us their concerns, um, illuminate the reasons that they feel differently than we do and see right away in the beginning if there's a compromise that we can come up with. If you have organizations or individuals who are opposed, um, heading that off at the pass can be a very good strategy. Um, sometimes though there are two sides that are very deeply dug in and there will never be agreement and it's just going to be a fight for the votes. And um, I believe in being cordial, so having a relationship with those people so they know what you're up to is always a good strategy, um, but sometimes we just can't come to agreement in the middle. But the people who support your idea, it's a very rare occasion that people would advance a bill all by themselves. We try to get support from a broad range of perspectives, and we try to illuminate the different reasons why people may support this idea. So generally, working in coalition um, is a standard um, a standard approach and something that we should assume will strengthen our opportunity to advance the bill. Another question that we need to think about with our idea is where does this fit in current law? Sometimes there is a law that exists and we need to change it. Uh, small change, for example, the audit limit, as I mentioned, there was an existing audit limit in law and we thought, eh, this could be better. So we needed to make a technical, small technical change to existing law. But sometimes what we want to do is create something that's entirely new. If any of you have ideas that you've been thinking about or you hope to work on or you've been successful with in the past of ideas that were entirely new or changes to existing law, um, please send them in to us. We'd be really interested to hear on the chat what kinds of ideas you've brought forward. Um, what other issues is it related to? It could be that you have an idea that um, you, you think is a small technical fix, but actually it triggers other changes in law or the things are related to each other. So thinking about how pieces of the law relate to each other will be important as you're understanding the lay of the land for advancing your idea. And then understanding specifically where does it fit in current Minnesota law um, is one of the important things that you'll need to think about as you work with people to draft the bill going forward. So in the case of the audit limit, there's a section of nonprofit law in the state of Minnesota that covers soup to nuts for nonprofits, and it's called 317A. So we needed to know that we were seeking a change to current law in the section of the law called 317A so we could see where that change would occur. If you don't know where that is when you're in the idea stage, that's fine. People along the way will let you know. So we have an idea. We've determined who supports it, who opposes it. We understand if it's a change to current law or if it's a new idea. We kind of have a sense of what it would do, what the change would be. The reality is we can't do this work by ourselves. 
we need to find a legislative champion because the only people who can actually shepherd our idea through the process is people who hold elected office. So the first thing we need to do is find a person or more than one person in the legislature who is willing to work with you to advance your idea. We often call them your legislative champion. Some of the questions that you might ask yourself when you're trying to find this person or these people would be, very simply, who do you know? If your neighbor is a state legislator or your brother-in-law or somebody you met at a party or <laughs> whatever, um, you might call that person first and ask them if they're interested in your idea or if they know somebody who might be. Another really obvious choice is who represents you. And in the case of most of you who I assume are joining this call in your capacity as staff or board members or volunteers for nonprofit organizations, the who represents you question could be either who represents you personally where you reside or perhaps more strategically, who represents the area that your nonprofit organization serves, which would be, in, in many instances, the legislative district where the people that you serve are voters and reside. Another way to think about this is who might care about the issue. Um, there are a variety of resources that can help you understand the personal interests and motivation of people who hold elected office. There are things written about them on the Internet. Um, there's a great book called um, put out by Politics in Minnesota that um, interviews every legislator and writes things about whether they like ice fishing or, you know, their spouse is a child care provider or whatever. You can learn a lot of things about legislators through available information. And if you have a bill, for example, to strengthen something in the child care system, and you're reading about a state legislator whose occupation is childcare or has an advanced degree in early childhood education, you might approach that person um, with the assumption that they understand and care about the issue that you're advancing. And then another way to think about a legislative champion is who serves in strategic committee positions. So we'll, it, shortly we'll get to the path that a bill takes. Um, it goes through committees and when you determine what committee your bill will go through, finding a champion on the committee where this will be discussed is a great strategy. If you can find a champion who is on the committee, who has an existing understanding or concern about the issue, and perhaps who represents you, um, boy, that would be a, a great person to work with on your bill. So the next thing we need to do is get our bill drafted. We need to get language that represents what our idea will do. So getting a bill drafted is, we, we talk about that as we are going to get the bill drafted. Actually, we seek assistance from people who are formal players in this process to have bills drafted, which will then be introduced. We, in the state of Minnesota, we get our bills drafted through the author of the bill. So you've identified your champion. You've asked that person to shepherd your bill through the process and be your bill's author. And then it is through that person that you initiate the bill drafting process. There are different people who work in the legislative process who can actually do the work of developing the draft bill. It can be done through the revisor's office the legal counsel of either the House or Senate, or department staff, so through the Department of whatever, Health and Human Services, Transportation, DEED, whatever um, administrative department your subject matter exists in. So there are a variety of technical ways and people um, that can do this, but the point for you to understand is that the person who has agreed to be your champion in the legislature will be the person who can initiate this process with the bill drafters. So Susie, I have a question. I know that words really matter and it's important to get the language right. Is it ever possible for an organization to propose language to their bill author to then have a revisor draft up? Absolutely, great question, Renal. In fact, um, we, we rely on the bill author to initiate the process and we rely on one of these entities to do the drafting, but they actually really rely on us to have the expertise. 
So we can provide that a variety of ways. We can write it up in a Word document and hand it to them and say, we'd like it to be based on this. We can send it in an email if we've had that kind of connection with them. Or we can have a meeting with them and we can talk through it so we can make sure that our concerns are being conveyed and that the person who's got the legal and technical skills to do the official drafting understands what we're seeking. There is a, a, certainly a process that this can be drafted multiple times. Um, and so if it doesn't look right the first time, then we can go back and keep working on it. I'll just add that there is a really great guide from the revisor's office on drafting legislation that we've included in our resources section. Great, thanks. And this is also another opportunity where in a couple of slides ago when we talked about who might care about this, either in support or opposed to our idea, that our draft bill is a great opportunity to engage with those people. We can show them the draft and we can say, this is what we're proposing to do, this is what it will look like in law, are there any changes that you'd like to see happen, are there any ways we need to continue to work on this. But finally, we get to um, the end point and we have our bill drafted and then we need to get it introduced. When you get a bill introduced, you often move from having a single legislative champion to multiple supporters. And this is another really strategic question where we need to think about who makes most sense to be public supporters of this bill. So when bills are introduced, they are introduced with the names of supporters attached to them. So the public can see this bill has been introduced and it has this list of supporters. It doesn't always need to have multiple supporters, but it certainly is an indication of, um, of, of additional support. And it's a step that we always recommend. Different ways you can think about this is um, one way that we at the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits always um, ad adhere to is to get bipartisan authors. Now, as you may understand from politics, you know, having bipartisan authors is not always essential. For example, today the Democrats hold both the House and the Senate. In a day not long ago, the Republicans held the majorities in both the House and the Senate. So you can certainly get bills through the system with only the support of one party, if that's the majority party. Um, but in general, it is our belief um, and certainly as nonpartisan organizations, that building support in the early stages across the political aisle is a good strategy. Another thing to think about with getting authors is who's on the committee where this will go, and are there other people on the committee that would offer their early support for this bill, and they could provide some leadership within their committee. And then we need to, as you saw in the little video, um, this needs to go through the House and Senate, so we will need to get authors for this bill in both the House and the Senate. And you get what's called a chief author, and then you get additional authors. There's some nuances here. If people have questions, they can call me afterwards. But sometimes you might see that a bill that looks identical is introduced multiple times. And sometimes that happens because you've been able to build more support for introducing the bill than the bill introduction process actually allows. For example, in the Senate, the bills can have five authors. But if you get 50 people who want to sign on to your bill, you may decide to introduce the bill 10 times. That might be a little bit extreme. But you do see bills sometimes that are introduced more than once because you've been able to gather support from more than are allowed. The next thing that happens, and when you get these um, supporters, you literally walk around with a piece of paper and you ask them to sign their name on it. And that is how they indicate their support for the bill. Then you literally do something called drop the bill in the hopper. And there's the hopper right there, um, that little basket. There's a hopper in the House and the Senate. You literally drop your bill in there and some fine person picks it up and puts it through the process to get it actually introduced. Bills then become introduced into each body, the House and Senate, through an action of the floor. You can see that your bill has been introduced um, by reading the journal of the floor session. And then immediately a bill gets referred. This is where the floor, uh, it goes through the 
floor to get introduced and it gets sent to a committee. So one of the questions you'll need to be thinking about with your author and the reviser is where will it be referred? This really shouldn't be a surprise. It should be a conversation that you're having along the way so you can understand things like it's going to the Commerce Committee, so I'd like to have people on the Commerce Committee sign on to my bill. The people who are helping you draft the bill should be able to help you figure out where it will go. Susie, we have a question from Jennifer. Jennifer asks, how many signers do you need before it goes into the hopper? Thanks, Jennifer. You need only one, but it is strategic to have more than one. And um, sometimes, this is not always the case, sometimes bills that have only one author are seen as um, maybe having less probability to move forward. They may be seen as one person's you know, pet project or something that's very specific to a need in a single legislative district, particularly if it's introduced only in the House or the Senate and only with one author. So although technically you only need one, um, sometimes people sort of read into that as maybe a bill that's not going to go anywhere. Um, but also, for the reasons that I've stated before, having multiple authors can help you get early support, which will naturally be something that helps kind of through the, through the process as you move forward. Okay, so your bill has been referred to committee, and we'll talk here a bit about the committee process. One of the things that's important to note is that um, a bill could have multiple committee stops, multiple hearings, um, or just one. And uh, that really depends on a variety of things about the bill. One of the things it depends on is whether there's money attached to it, if it needs to go through a policy committee and then a money committee, a finance committee. Um, but it can depend on a lot of other things, like. Um, who cares about the, what, you know, who, meaning what areas of the law um, have an interaction with a particular bill that you're proposing? It's, it would not be uncommon, for example, that a bill might start in commerce that might have something to do with a business transaction, and then it would need to go to judiciary because there are legal issues related to it. And then if that bill also had uh, money attached to it, which is called a fiscal note, that it might need to go to a finance committee. So, and other things just go to one committee and then they're done. Another thing to note is that um, in, in the state of Minnesota anyway, your bill may be considered a standalone bill, which means it will travel all by itself and it will become law as a single subject item or, as is very common in the state of Minnesota, it may be considered something to be included in what's called an omnibus bill. And an omnibus bill is where the committees wrap all kinds of ideas together into one big bill and they move together as a package. In any case, whether it's going to one hearing or several, whether it's standalone or an omnibus bill, the following things are important steps. One is to discuss your idea with committee members. Do they support it? Do they oppose it? Talk, if you can, talk to every member in the committee. The other idea is you really need to discuss the idea with the committee chair because the committee chair controls the agenda for the committee. These bills are sent to committees and then the chair has a decision to make about which bills will get a hearing and which bills won't. So it's really important that you work with the committee chair and make sure that your bill gets a hearing. It's important to keep in close contact with your chief author because that's the person who's technically and formally responsible for shepherding it through the process. They will need your support frequently and it will be really important to thank them. In many cases, if you are getting stuck and getting a hearing, it'll be working with your chief author and they working with the committee chair to make sure that this is gonna go through the process. And then if you are granted a hearing for your bill, the next step is to be prepared to arrange testimony and support for the day of the hearing. I have a quick question. Right is on. it important to meet with or lobby all the committee members before there's a hearing of the bill? It's not essential to do so, but um, if you are able to do so, it's certainly helpful if people on the committee are um, not surprised by your issue, if you're able to answer their questions in advance, particularly if they have misunderstanding or misinformation about the topic, having some of these things um, sorted out in conversations prior to the committee is really helpful. It's not essential. Sometimes there's not time, 
but it reduces the surprises for both you and the members of the committee when it comes to a hearing. So preparing for testimony. In the Minnesota legislature, when bills are, here, are heard in committee, it is very, very common that members of the public will testify, and obviously that's an important part of our democratic process. So um, I, I put up here the first one, what do you want the committee to do, vote for or against? Obviously, if this is your bill, you want them to vote for it. Um, but I would just highlight that this slide is um, relevant information if you are testifying for something that somebody else has raised that you are not supporting. You can use the same steps for preparing your testimony. So in that case, what do you want the committee to do? You might want them to vote against. So one of the really important things to figure out is what unique information do you have that might influence the committee to do what you want them to do? And to your previous point, Renal, about talking with the committee members in advance, this is where you might find in um, private conversations with members of the committee what they think is most interesting. Do they want data from the field? Do they want stories? Do they want anecdotes? What, is the, what are the salient issues that they'd like to hear about? If you came up with this idea or your organization did, no doubt you have unique information. So sorting out specifically beyond we'd like you to vote for it, what unique information you can offer will be really helpful. The next, uh, Renal, question? No, go ahead. Okay, the next couple of points are really about clarity and being concise. My recommendation is that you develop two to four main points that support your position. It's very common that we know 100 things that would be um, points of support for your idea. And there may be other ways you can convey those 98 <laughs> items, but going before a legislative committee to do testimony is time to be really clear about what the main things are. And you may need to sort that out in your organization in advance, thinking with leaders or talking to other people to figure out really what are the key things we want to convey. And then plan testimony that will be two to three minutes. Generally, short testimony is better than long testimony, but also it's important to know that in many committee hearings, particularly if there's substantial interest from the public, and lots of testifiers, they will put a two to three minute limit on your testimony. And you really don't want to um, just get through your two to three minutes and find out that you're not able to go on and you haven't gotten to your main points. The next point that I would suggest that you do is write it down and practice. Read it in front of the mirror, read it in front of uh, a friend, or maybe even better yet, read it in front of somebody who makes you a little nervous <laughs> because um, for most people, being in front of the legislative committee um, could make people a little bit nervous, but practice. The next thing that I would suggest if you have the chance is to visit the committee during a hearing before the hearing in which you will be testifying. I find it very useful to sit in on a committee hearing in advance to just see in that particular legislative session with that particular committee leadership, what are the culture and conventions of interacting with that committee? There are some very specific conventions in the state legislature around how you introduce yourself and, and who speaks first, the committee chair, you, and there's some very specific things. And if people have questions about that or would like some coaching prior to doing testimony, please don't hesitate to call us directly. But there are also culture and culture and norms within each committee. Um, does this committee laugh a lot? Do they bring snacks? Do people read while, they're, while people are testifying? Um, you know, just kind of watching how the committee interacts is often useful. Then usually you need to sign up to testify in advance. Not always, but usually. And it's often a good idea so you feel prepared and they know you're coming and you know you're committed to doing this. Um, in some instances, if you don't sign up, the committee chair will say, is there anybody else who would like to comment on this? And then you can get up and provide spontaneous testimony, although for most people, um, planning this in advance is really helpful. I'd suggest getting there early, particularly if it's a hearing where that you expect large turnout from the public, and then relax. Simple to say, um, harder to do, but I suggest really thinking about this group of people as regular people, this is a citizen legislature, um, regular folks 
Most of them, hopefully by this point, you've already met. Um, and they're really interested in your thoughts. And actually, they rely on the information that you have in order to make the best decisions. A, there's a question from Renee from, I think, the previous slide. She wants to know, are we going over our legislative champion's head if we arrange to meet with committee members on our own, or is that something that the legislative champion would typically do? That's a great question, Renee, and I think I'd like to break it into two parts. One is going over a legislator's head, which we don't want to do. Is that how you said it? Um, and the other is, um, meeting with the committee members. So basically, we don't want to get out in front of our, our legislative champion. We want to be working really closely with them, and we want them to shepherd it through the process. So sometimes you might need to ask a committee, uh, excuse me, ask your legislative champion, um, would it be okay if I did this, or do you think it would be a smart move if I did that? Um, but in other cases, there are things that we just should be expected to do, and it would be helpful to tell our legislative champion, but we should take our own initiative. So I'll give two examples. I'll start with the latter. It should be an expectation that we're going to meet with all the committee members. I would say if it were my bill, I would tell my legislative champion, I know that part of this process is for me to go and talk to everybody, so I am planning to do that. And your legislative champion, I assume, will say, great. You could say to them, if there's anybody in particular that you'd like to meet with, with me, we could do that. Or if there's anybody in particular that you think I shouldn't meet with, I'll take your advice. But basically, you take that on as your own responsibility, and you let them know that you're doing your job. An example where you might want to check with them is working with the committee chair to arrange a hearing. That might be something where you would say, particularly if they're on the committee, you might want to say, um, you know, I know you have a close relationship with chairman whomever, um, and one of us really should be working with that person to get make sure that we have a hearing. Is that something that you are able to do in your position on the committee or through your relationship with that legislator, or would you like me to do that? And then you could take their lead. Um, but I, the point you raised generally about sort of going going over or around our legislative champion. You know, these are important relationships. They can be delicate. It's a stressful place. And what we don't want to do is annoy or alienate the people who we're most counting on to move our bill. Um, so the spirit of your question is right on, um, Renee. Okay, so next it goes through a path. And unlike the cute little video, um, what you can see on the left there is that the path is actually really circuitous. And sometimes it's hard to follow. And I've been going to the Capitol for many years, um, and I still find it hard to follow sometimes how things are moving through the process. So don't ever feel um, uninformed or, or dumb or like you don't belong there or whatever if you're having trouble following your bill because it happens to all of us. But these are some of the ways that it could go. Your bill could pass in the committee and go to the floor. It could be a bill that has one committee hearing. It's moving as a standalone bill. It passes, and on it goes. That's the path of least resistance, and if you can get that, good for you. Um, another option is that it could pass through the first committee and go to another committee, and they will say that. They will say, you know, this bill has passed and has been referred to the Judiciary Committee or whatever. So then you know basically same process, start over, keep going. Another option is it could be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. So that is technical language that they use all the time where basically they're saying, thank you for this information. We will consider this bill, and if we decide to take it up, we will put it in our big bill that has all kinds of stuff in it. So often a committee will end up with a big omnibus bill at the end of the legislative session and it will have a bunch of stuff in it. If this happens, your work with that committee is not done because you need to continue to encourage them to include it in the omnibus bill and that work should be directed at the committee chair who has the most power over developing the omnibus bill. Another option is it could get stalled in the committee. They could say, thank you very much, this was interesting, but actually we need to hear more or we need to learn more, or we're not ready to vote, or we're going to table this and we'll think about it next year, or whatever. So the process could come to a halt. Um, and another, of course, is it could be defeated in the committee. It could be voted down. You could lose the vote. Now, this shouldn't happen very often. 
And the reason this shouldn't happen very often is because we really should know what's going to happen with the vote, if possible. And how do we know that? It's because we've talked to everybody on the committee in advance, and we've asked them, do you support or oppose this? It's common, well, many, many bills, I wish I had numbers, I didn't collect them in advance, but many, many bills never get a hearing. And one of the reasons a bill might not get a hearing is because somebody has talked to the members of the committee and they understand that it's not going to pass, that everybody's going to vote against it. So the committee decides to not take the time to hear that bill if it's not going to pass. Uh, sometimes bills are defeated in committee as a surprise. That's unfortunate. Um, you can recover from that, but you probably need to recover from that in a different legislative session by reintroducing it and um, working in a little different way with the people on the committee to make sure that it can get through that process. So your path following the committee hearing will then determine your next step. I have a quick question, yeah. Susie. Right what role does politics play in determining the best path? Oh, boy, path? that's another webinar. Um, <laughs> politics is everywhere, um, but it doesn't have the same impact on every bill. Um, and there's really no easy answer to that question. I would say my anecdotal observation is that there are some bills where there's essentially no politics in it. And, and I, I would like to hope that the bills that we've introduced, which, you know, everybody loves nonprofits, everybody in the legislature, I'm sure, donates to nonprofits. Most of them are leaders in the community and serve on some boards. People are volunteers. You know, people really get it with nonprofits. And we seek bipartisan support. And we acknowledge and give awards to members of both the Democratic and the Republican Party. And, you know, so we try to really tone down politics. So I would hope that ours would be examples of bills where um, there would be little in the way of politics. There are all kinds of other things that nonprofits do where politics should not play into um, whether your bill advances or not. You know, a bill on on mentoring or a bill on, um, I was just going to say early childhood education, although that's gotten political. Um, but p politics can play into things. Um, it's unfortunate. It's a reality. Um, often we don't understand why or how that's having an influence on our bill. Um, but we keep our chin up and we proceed. And I would say um, don't engage <laughs> in the politics. When your bill passes out of the committee, there are basically two options, as I alluded to before. It may go to another committee, in which case it's time to repeat the whole process, um, or it may go to the floor. And one thing that um, I just want to make sure people understand is that bills need to be introduced in both the House and the Senate, and they should be moving concurrently in both bodies. So you're doing double-time work on this. Um, doing exactly the same work in both the House and the Senate. When your bill goes to the floor, basically there are two steps that happen, sometimes on the same day, sometimes on different days, although the vast majority of time it's on the same day. Your bill will get what's called a second reading, and this is where your bill author presents it on the floor of the House or the Senate, and their colleagues debate it and can offer amendments. And so your bill may change substantially in this part of the process. This is where really most of the action is. Um, and then they take a vote. And if your bill passes, well, they take a vote on every amendment, pass or fail, and they take a vote on the whole bill. If your bill passes second reading, it advances to something called third reading. And in many cases, that happens immediately. They'll gavel, the vote has passed, and then they'll say third reading, and they do it immediately. Third reading is a place where people might make speeches about why they support or oppose the bill, but there won't be amendments. Amendments are not allowed on third reading. So while in the second reading there might be a robust conversation which is around debating the purpose of the bill, making changes to it, um, thinking about the why and the impact, the third reading is really where people say, I support or oppose this because. And sometimes there are lots of speeches if it's political. You know, if anybody watched the, the debate on same-sex marriage last year, lots and lots of speeches on third reading. People really wanted their constituents to understand why they were voting a certain way. This is basically where legislators are communicating with their constituents. 
Why do I feel this way? But there are no amendments. So when third reading is done, the bill goes for a vote again. It either passes or fails. Um, let's assume it passes, then it moves on to the governor. One of the things I want to note is that unlike in the committee, there is no public testimony in the House and the Senate. Only legislators themselves can speak. If people haven't gone to the Capitol to take a look at a floor session and watch it from the gallery, I'd suggest you go. You could go with one of us someday. It's just great. It's just democracy in action. It's super fun, and it's an important thing to see in Minnesota. Okay, I'm advancing this. So congratulations, your bill has passed. It has moved off the floor through passing third reading, and you need to consider a few things. Is it moving concurrently in the other body? It has to be. If it is not, all of this is for nothing. Well, maybe not for nothing, but really you want it to be moving in both bodies. Are there differences in the two bills? So as I mentioned before, um, it, there can be amendments on the floor in the second reading. There also, I didn't mention this, could have been amendments put on it in the committee process. Now you can kind of work to manage the amendments in the committee process because you're really involved, but once it goes to the floor, it's, you're really not involved anymore. So things, the bills that you introduced identically in the House and Senate could come out of those bodies looking somewhat differently. And one of the questions is, if there are amendments, can you live with them? Hopefully you can at this point. If your bill comes out of the House and Senate looking differently, even just by one word or substantively different, your bill needs to go to something called a conference committee. And the conference committee is convened when bills differ upon passage in the House and Senate, and they are as follows. They're joint committees of the House and Senate. They are comprised of members of the committees in which those bills were heard in the House and Senate. And sometimes, but not always, they're, sometimes they're bipartisan and sometimes they're um, just one political party. But usually they tend to be uh, about three to five members from the House and about three to five members from the Senate. They tend to be fairly small committees convened just for this purpose to sort out the differences. Um, and they discuss the differences, they do some negotiating, and um, they decide on a final bill. It is common in the conference committee that they don't take public testimony, but they can if they choose to. So one current example of a bill that's, I would say, stuck in conference committee, no doubt you all have heard about, is the minimum wage bill. So that passed in both the House and Senate with very substantive differences. The main ones that are currently being debated, the main one, is whether this should be indexed to inflation, so automatically go up over the years. So the, there have been three members of the House appointed and three members of the Senate appointed to this conference committee. In the case of this conference committee, they're all Democrats, and they are charged with discussing the differences. And if you read the news, you'll know that this is not an easy task and that they've been stuck for several weeks. But after they've resolved their differences and they've agreed on a final version of the bill, the bill needs to go back to the House and Senate floor for final passage and that is a time when no amendments are allowed. So that's really the final step. It's a fairly simple step after the conference committee has come to their agreement. Okay, let's go to the governor. Um, the next step is that all bills except for constitutional amendments in the state of Minnesota must go to the governor. As you all probably noticed in the 2012 legislative session and, and election cycle, um, there were two bills that proceeded as constitutional amendments that basically go around the process of getting signed by the governor. So that's the only time when that occurs. Um, so this is the final step in your bill becoming a law. The governor has um, some, uh, some options. Um, the most straightforward one is that the bill gets sent to the governor and he signs it and maybe there's a little signing ceremony like we saw in the last um, slide and you can go to that and it'll be exciting. Um, one of the ways that this happens is you've worked with the governor's office um, throughout your process here. You don't need to work with them endlessly, um, but talking to the governor's office in advance, finding out who the policy staff person is who deals with the area that you're working in, and making sure that they understand that you have this bill, that you expect it to proceed, and you will be eventually asking the governor to sign it is a really important step. 
if anybody has questions as they're doing this work about how to make that connection with the governor's office, please don't hesitate to be in touch with us. So the governor has three days to either sign the bill into law or veto the bill. If the governor vetoes a bill, it will come with a veto letter, which will explain his, in our case, or his or her in the future, um, rationale for their veto. Um, hopefully, if this is your bill that you are moving forward, you will not be surprised by a veto from the governor. Um, we can get surprises in the end. We have to manage them very carefully, um, but hopefully this isn't one of them. A couple of other options for the governor's action includes the governor can line item specific spending items. If your bill doesn't have any money in it, then that doesn't matter. But if there's money in bills, then that's an area where he can um, pass most of the bill that line item specific spending. The, bill can, the, the governor can also choose to take no action on the bill in which case the bill becomes law without a signature. If we were here in the room and we were all talking together, I'd say, why, why do you think a, bill, a governor might do that? Um, it may be that there's a governor who, on a particular bill, decides that they, for whatever reason, can't actively support this bill. They, for whatever political reason, policy reason, practical reason, but they understand that there's overwhelming support from the legislature and the public, so they're not going to get in the way of it becoming law. So they take no action. Um, another thing that I am aware of only happening once in the state of Minnesota, although it may have happened multiple times, is that a governor could miss the deadline for three days. And that essentially is the same as taking no action, in which case the bill becomes law with it this governor's signature. And the final thing I'll just mention very briefly, it's not that common, it's only every other year that it's possible, is that there could be something called a pocket veto. And this only happens in the second case of the biennium. It's when bills are presented to the governor within the last three days of the legislative session and the governor takes no action on the bill, in which case, unlike taking no action during the regular part of the session, in this case, it becomes effectively a veto. I've got a question from Jennifer. Uh, she writes, if your bill gets changed during the process such that you no longer want to push it through in its latest iteration, is there a way to withdraw it? Thanks, Jennifer. That would be go straight to your author and say this isn't going to work. And work with your chief author to say this is why this is no longer going to achieve what we want it to do. You know, this, this becomes complicated. Um, and a little tense if this happens. But what I would do in that case, let's say, um, you know, in the committee process something terrible happened. I would go back to my chief author and I would thank them profusely for getting it as far as they did. And I would say, what we really need to do is spend more time and do additional work in the interim, which means between sessions, and come back with this again next year. Let's say, for example, somebody thought they had a good idea, they thought that they were on your side on this, they offered amendment which passed, which really screwed up the whole thing. You could say to your chief author, you know, we, we've been, we know these people, we've been working with these people, we really would like to come to some consensus on this, it's going to take more time, I'd like to ask that we let this bill die and that we work together over the interim and to reintroduce it next year. And if you've done all your homework all along the way, um, you should you know, have a good relationship with your chief author so that that will be okay, and you should hopefully have some sort of relationship with whoever has <coughs> intervened in your bill in a way that you didn't like, so you actually can work with them over time. You know, I suppose it's possible that a, an author could say, well, this was your idea, but I've decided I really like it, and I don't agree with you about the direction that it's gone being detrimental, so I'm going to proceed with it. And then wouldn't that be weird if you had to fight against your own bill? But anything can happen here. Okay, your bill passed. Time to celebrate and thank. Terrific. So we always certainly recommend that we celebrate with our allies. And why is that? It's not just to drink the champagne. It's to think about what did we just do what kind of impact did that make, and what else could we do together? Thanking the legislators and the staff you worked with is critical. Um, these people, you need them to do future work together. They are working as our public servants. They have busy jobs, and they helped get your 
idea um, to the top of the agenda, and um, it's very much worth thanking them because they did hard work, but in your general relationship maintenance as well, and then thanking anybody else who might have helped you along the way. So we've got the cake, we've got the champagne, we've sent out the thank you notes. Are we done? Not quite. It's very important to be attentive to implementation as your next step. Depending on what the new law does, there may be substantial implementation duties and nuances. So be sure to follow the process through to its conclusion to ensure that it is working in the way that you intended. I'd like to give one real-time example of implementation complexity. You know, Minsure is all in the news these days, and um, there was a bill that passed, I don't even know what year, it was, maybe it was last year, maybe it was the year before, but basically a legislative bill that established that there would be something called Minsure in Minnesota. And then after that bill was passed, there was amazing work that needed to happen to develop a board of directors, to hire staff, to decide who's going to be eligible, to apply for which kinds of um, programs. And, you know, as you all know from the news, it's been a complex thing, and implementation was a critical part to anything happening in the beginning, but has also been a really important part um, of something to monitor as this has rolled out with, you know, as we know, lots of complexity. Um, lots of organizations and healthcare advocates who have put in a lot of hard work on the bill when that happened really continued to be um, ongoing watchers and advocates of this as it was um, implemented in order to become a public program. So we'd like to offer these resources. We're very close to the end. Any final questions, please send them in. Um, we have advocacy resources on our website, including a module which includes um, topics related to this. We have um, great state information, and that is available on the Internet and in person at the Capitol. Basically, there are three offices that we typically rely on. One is called House Information. One is the House Chief Clerk's Office and one is called Senate Information. The information offices are, as they're described, they have things like information on legislators and hearings and committees and things like that. The chief clerk's office is often the place where you can get process and calendar questions answered, like is my bill gonna go to the floor tomorrow or what are they doing on the floor today? On the Senate side, the Senate Information Office um, holds that responsibility as well. The revisor's office is the place where the laws, the bills are written, and the Minnesota Legislative Library is on the sixth floor of the state office building, and it's available open to the public, and they have terrific librarians there who can help you look up statutes, and they can help you understand the history of a particular bill or a particular law. I'd really like to invite you to be in touch with us directly if you have questions or care for assistance or coaching. Um, you can contact me. Again, I'm Susie Brown or my colleague, Renal. Um, we provide our services to our members in a variety of ways. One is like this, where you can join in and learn in a, in a wide-scale format, but another is direct assistance, and we're happy to take your calls at any time. Whoop, end of the slideshow. I'd also just like to... Um, ask Renal to talk a little bit about our upcoming trainings, which we hope you will find valuable and we hope that you can join us. Yeah, we'd like to invite you to join us next week on Friday, April 11th at our Capital Lab. This is an opportunity for you to kind of get into the different buildings and understand the space and see where a lot of the images that we included in our PowerPoint come to life. Um, and get a handle of the resources firsthand. Um, at noon, we'll be doing kind of an optional bring your own or buy your own lunch in the Department of Transportation cafeteria. Um, it's a great opportunity to kind of see where the people mingle and um, get a sense of who spends their time at the Capitol. And that if you care to join us for that lunch at noon, you can ask us your specific questions and we'll be happy to provide you know, any assistance or um, information that would be useful to your particular situation. Another event that we think you might be interested in is working with Congress, and that's not gonna be until June 17th at the Northwest Area Foundation. Um, that is an opportunity where you'll have a chance to hear from and ask questions to congressional staffers at the federal level that are in district. A way to talk about your priorities without having to go all the way to DC. Check out the full list of our 2014 MCN advocacy trainings and events at our website and sign up through there.
Thanks for joining us today.